This is 51st Dates, and I'm your host, Julie Moore. They say that hindsight is 2020. I decided to find out if that's true. Every week, I'm going to read a chapter from my memoir, 51st Dates, then give you the backstory and commentary on what really went down. It's been two whole years since I went on these dates, and I'll be experiencing them along with you as I read. We'll find out together if my future self learned anything. I don't know if I have anything figured out, but at least we'll share some laughs along the way. Dating in Southern California is nothing if not entertaining. Ready? Strap in. Let's go. Good morning and welcome to episode 28 of 51st Dates. I'm your host, Julie Moore. Uh, my hair's not wet, so that's a, <laughs> that's a that's a bonus. Actually, I just didn't bother this morning. I went biking and then showered and then after that, worked on the book. Um, a book, not the book. There's no the book in my life. So um, yesterday, last night, I actually finished uh, my 25th book, which is a huge, huge milestone. Um, it feels like For some reason, that number, I've always wanted to hit that number. Um, Obviously, I write under, uh, well, different pen names. I used to have four, but now I'm down to just Jolie and the other. Um, And it feels really good. It's sort of interesting because one of the things I've been thinking about is that sort of what you want idea. And I think one of the things I want is somebody who can celebrate my successes along with me. Um, I was married. When I was married, I wrote maybe, hmm, I don't know, 15, 16, 17, 18. I'm not sure. You know, I don't know. Um, books. And there was like little to no acknowledgement of what I was doing. I remember when I got my first publishing publishing contract, um, my ex was like, well, they hand them out to anybody because they have to fill slots. And... Um, I was struggling with my second book on that contract. Uh, I didn't think it was good enough. I mean, there's a whole lot of issues around that. And um, my ex was like, well, they have to publish something, so they'll publish anything, so it doesn't really matter what you turn in. Um, That was great. I remember, actually, I hit, um, when I first hit USA Today, um, my son was in third grade, and a fellow author had emailed me from like New Zealand because she's up at the crack of dawn, obviously, because of the time difference. And she's like, I checked, you know, USA Today and you hit this week. And um, authors do that all the time. It's the same for New York Times because you can get it a week in advance, usually through an agent. So usually somebody will tell you that you hit a list before you did. You find out yourself. Um, unless you're up all night refreshing, which I guess is a thing. Um, and I was like, oh, that's so great. I was so thrilled um, to hear that from her. And, you know, I got up probably at the crack of dawn um, and checked myself. And I was like, yeah, I hit USA Today. Um, and a lot of friends congratulated me because the list is obviously public. Um, and I was like pretty proud of myself. I had made a goal in 2018, 17, one of those years to hit um, the bestseller list and I'd achieved it and I was pretty happy. And I was like, I went through the day and I never told my ex. I remember picking my son up from school. He was in third grade. So it must be two years ago. Maybe he was in second grade. I don't know. And I was like, oh, you know, the thing I told you I was doing, I hit USA to bestseller list. And my son was thrilled. He's like bebopping and dancing in the car on the way home. And I finally get home um, later that night and or my ex finally gets home. And I finally told him. I mean, I'd obviously talked to like 50 people that day who were really thrilled for me. And I sort of waited because I knew that, obviously I must have known that he was going to put a damper on it. And I told him, I'm like, I hit USA Today bestseller this week. And he was like, well, is that the goal that you had wanted to achieve? And I was like, it, it was. And he was like, well, then you achieved it. And that was it. Um, and we had this bottle of champagne that we had gotten years ago. And he was like, oh, no, I was like, well, you know, why don't we open this champagne to celebrate? And he's like, no, we have to save that for a special occasion. Because um, apparently hitting USA Today is not a special occasion. Oh, my God, I don't even know why I've gone down this rabbit hole. Oh, it's because I hit book 25. So it feels like a huge milestone um, to have done that, especially since the majority of the time I've been writing, it's been with very little support. Um, my ex thought it was like, 
a hobby and as long as it didn't inconvenience him um it was okay but I remember putting up pictures I was like thinking about this today I um at some point I got uh, my book covers printed there's a whatever a local printer um in Burbank who did does a great job if you want business cards and stuff maybe I'll like uh put a <laughs> drop a link in the show notes does a great job and um so I got my book covers printed and then I went to the framer um great framer way out in the middle of like North Hollywood or something does a great job very inexpensive no ambiance in the place but so I go to the framer and the framer's like these are your books and I'm like yeah and I'm getting them framed and he was like you should celebrate your accomplishments so I pick them up in a couple days um and at that this point I get like it's this weird a special ladder because we had the spiral staircase in um the house and it was difficult to like hang things on the wall because the stairs turn um, but I found this ladder, um, that does stairs and I hung up the book covers at that time. It was like maybe three, four or five. And so I was super proud. Um, cause it's something like my 10 year old self would be so thrilled with. Um, cause I read so many books as a kid and the idea that you could create the same thing that you enjoyed is magical. Um, so I put up these, uh, pictures on the wall and my ex was like, well, I hope you enjoy your vanity wall. Um, it was I don't even know. It was so hard to live in that space where I wanted to do things and wanted to stretch my wings and wanted to be proud of the things I accomplished um, to sort of get batted down at every turn. Um, and that's actually not even what I was gonna thinking I was going to talk about today. So the thing I want to talk about is there's a new Oprah book. Um, so every so often, Oprah does these little books. She doesn't seem to write much of anything um, in my estimation. You know, obviously somebody who just poured through an entire book, but she has these, one is like a book of quotes and I don't know, probably some books about food and eating that I haven't read, but the latest one I think is called What Happened to You. It came out a few weeks back and I, you know, you get emails or I get emails about a lot of books and I clicked on it and I was like, I'm probably not going to spend $10, $20 on this, um, given that the reviews suggested it's just like a back and forth interview but not really imparting information in a good way. And a lot of them recommend that you read um, a different book on trauma, which is uh, trauma, oh shoot, something, oh God, I can't remember the book. I read it a few weeks ago uh, about the body and trauma. But it was, so I clicked on it and I was like, well, let me just read the sample on Amazon and then I can go about my life and go get some stuff done. And I read the sample, um, the same was actually not that interesting. So there's a guy, whoever the other author is, who's a psychologist or psychiatrist. Uh, I can't remember if he had an MD or not. And, you know, he started studying PTSD and trauma and some of those things back before it was a thing that people talked about. There's a few of these sort of doctors who are interested in this sort of topic um, early on and have developed the body of work that we read now about trauma and how it affects humans. But one of the interesting things in the book is one of the first clients he has was a Korean War veteran, which shows you how old that is. And actually, because all the Korean War veterans I know are dead. Um, I say that maybe it's not that long ago, so there's probably a bunch of people alive, but most of my friends' fathers who were in the Korean War are long since dead. Anyway, so he's interviewing this, um, interviewing, uh, doing like a a session with this guy who brings in his girlfriend because they had gone to the movies or something innocuous and the guy had had a PTSD episode and you know was ducking between cars because he thought he was gonna get killed by fire um I'm sorry guns or planes or something and you know it took him a few minutes to get out of it and so he brought his girlfriend um who was really quite sympathetic to the session And, you know, he says to the guy, I don't want to lose her. He's like, but what's wrong with me? And the um, clinician turns and says, it's not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. And I've really been thinking about that the last two days. It's like the most profound shift because I spend a lot of time. Actually, I don't ask why. I mean, I really, really work on not asking why. But, and I ask what, or now what? But that's usually centered around what I'm going to do around other people's behavior. You know, why is my ex like, you know, sending me some email about, you know, 
you know, he loves me forever, whatever craziness that involves. And it, I don't get into why, because I don't know, I would want to be his girlfriend um, when he's sending those emails. But I get into the what now or what, and what I'm going to do about it is nothing, you know, delete and um, move to trash. But it's interesting. Okay, but even though I don't ask why, I want to know why. Who doesn't? Who doesn't want to know why, you know, this guy or any number of the guys like in this book can't connect with me or are like shut down, shut off, any number of things. I'm dying to know why. But the why is not something I'm going to ever know because I don't think they know. But I do think that the, through the stories they sort of tell me, I think that a question I need to ask is what happened? Because what they're exhibiting clearly is some kind of response to trauma or whatever um, happened in the past and um, has set limits on their ability to connect or be intimate or to, to relate to other people. And I obviously have similar uh, limitations, otherwise I would not be attracted to these people. But... Um, that whole trauma bonding thing is a shit show. I swear, I shit you not. Um, but that said, um, what happened to you is, feels like a better answer. Not for like the ex sending like the crazy I love you forever emails like that. You know, you put in a little box and you just shut that door. But in terms of current like relating in relationships, like when people are behaving in ways that are incongruent, out of integrity, um, just whatever, um, things that I feel are unacceptable to me. Um, and I stopped asking why it's mostly what, what am I going to do? Am I going to say something? Do I need to say something? Am I going to put up with it? I'm going to break up with them. Whatever that is, that's a whole decision making, um, rubric, but what is intriguing me, maybe more as a writer and less as a person in a relationship is what happened, um, and people will tell you, or um, the men I date will certainly tell me. I, I feel like there's like a bedroom confessional or like a living room confessional. They sit on my couch or they like sit up in my bed and they tell me like for three, four, five, six hours sometimes these long like winding stories of their childhood. Um, and usually it's it's spun in like a very matter of fact way. But if you dig down, it's like, you know, it's fairly traumatic, um, you know my mom did this or my dad did this or whatever. And you're like, wow, that's, that's a lot um, for a child to have to process. And so that's sort of interesting, but I'm now, it's not so much, I'm not, I'm not going to ask what happened. People will tell you and you can like glean that usually in the first couple conversations, people tend to like open up around me and tell me all their stuff right away, um, which I have a lot of thoughts about whether that's appropriate, but I always listen because I still believe in having more information rather than less. But it's something I think I'm going to think about um, when people are relating to me in a way that I feel is inappropriate or hurtful. I think I need to sort of step back and look at them in a very like, you know, empathetic way or sympathetic way and think about what happened to them to put them in this place. Now that doesn't change the what now. The what now is, no, I can't do it. I can't handle it. Or no, I need to address it and see whether or not that behavior can change or whatever that is. But the what happened is sort of um, an interesting, I think, key to empathy, um, an interesting key to relating to other people and seeing things a little bit from their perspective. Um, the what and what, the what is certainly what to be dealt with and the what now is the decision, but the what happened is um, sort of a key question to ask myself and think about as I relate to men and dating. And now, <laughs> I'm going to get to some more of that. I'm going to read chapter 27, which actually I have to go get, so I don't even know what it's about and I don't have it in front of me, but let's get to it. Chapter 27, Like Clockwork, June 9. Thunderbolt, are you still in LA? Me? I am. Just doing the usual Sunday yoga. Thunderbolt, nice. 
I didn't have the patience for the usual dance where he asked all sorts of oblique questions that were all variations of when can we next have sex. So I cut to the chase. Until Thursday, if you're game, I'm extending an invite for tonight. Thunderbolt, cool. If I can wrap up work, I'm down. Me? Let me know. I'm writing at the car wash, which is all kinds of nutso LA behavior. Eight hours later. Me? I'm quitting work for the night, out of ideas for my Chinese billionaire. You? Thunderbolt? I could swing by. Me? Okay, maybe you have Chinese billionaire ideas. Thunderbolt? Sure, I'll be there at 10.04. Me? That's oddly precise. Thunderbolt? Quoting the Lyft app. Me? LOL. Thunderbolt? Here. And he was here in my too clean apartment, that is. He looked at my clock as I invited him in through the front door. It was exactly four after ten. He pointed to that out and smiled. He took off his shoes, made himself at home, hung something on one of my hooks, borrowed a bottle opener from my kitchen drawer, took me to a gentle hug and kiss. It was odd somehow. Threw me off my game. We were casual. We were friends with benefits. The benefits being the bigger part of the equation. I'm not sure we were friends. I had friends. I don't think he was on the list. But there he was, mucking around with my rolling pin. How had he gotten so comfortable in my apartment? Maybe it was because he'd been there three weeks out of the last four? Usually, I'm the chatty one. I usually love to sit and talk for a few hours. But I didn't want that. All I wanted was the oblivion of sex. It's funny how much talk there is nowadays about living in the moment and being in the present. I'm finding that the only time I have those present moments are when I'm having sex. It's amazing how that can take my entire focus. It doesn't really give me time to think about anything or anyone else. After Thunderbolt pulled a glass from my cabinet, poured himself a pale ale a friend had given him, and started to sit to chat, I did a slow blink. Look, I started. I've already had a really bad week. Like, varsity level shitty. What happened? I'm not the least bit interested in talking about it. My week imploded somewhere between career suicide and forensic accountant. I held up my hands for air quotes around the two big problems I'd had, ignoring the elephant in the living room of my mind. I think my directors caught him off guard. He didn't even ask about classic car guy. I mentioned that my apartment was surgery sweet clean. I must have asked something because he was talking, though I didn't hear a damn thing. Somewhere in whatever he was saying, he was talking about how he'd chosen a college in upstate New York, going sight unseen because that's where he'd learned about film and met the guy who made the beer. And, and, and I was thinking, right, sure. I don't care about that, any of that right now. Normally, I love talking to him and would have been interested in Rochester and beer and his friend. I had a deep and abiding love of other people's stories, probably one of the things that made me love my job as an author. Fortunately, like most men, he was easily distracted. If there was a contest for the most enthusiastic and giving sex partner, Thunderbolt would win hands down. After I was quite satisfied in catching my breath, Thunderbolt was in my underwear drawer, unearthing my box of Costco condoms. He picked a couple out and put one on. Then he came back to face me. You said that we could try it, can we? Try what? It was an honest question. Eight or- orgasms in. I wasn't able to wade through the words he was saying to get to the meat of the question. Sex without a condom. Sure, if you want. I already opened this one, he said, talking after the close. Either way, that's a sunk cost. Like a kid about to open a Christmas present, he stripped off the condom. A long time later, when he announced that he was at the end of his rope, he asked, can I come inside you? Honestly, I thought that was part of a package deal with no condom. I shrugged as much as one could during sex. God, that's sweet of you. And he did. He dozed again. I didn't say a word until his eyes fluttered open. This time he didn't look at me like I was going to kill him in his sleep. I'm thinking of getting off dating apps, he announced. Why? I mean, I disabled my profiles because I'm leaving for the summer, but why would you do it? It makes me feel bad. It's like I'm commodifying women. Hey, I don't think I'm ready to do that quite yet. What are you looking for? Do you want a boyfriend, he asked. My mouth said, I don't know. My brain, my brain screamed yes. As a matter of fact, I thought I had one until five days ago when I broke up with the one I may have had. I didn't tell him about the list I'd written on a giant post-it and affixed to the inside of my closet door at the advice of both a friend and my therapist. The list of what I wanted in a guy, what I wanted in a long-term relationship, what I wanted in, gasp, tabooed word ahead, a boyfriend. He yawned, big and long this time. When did you get back in town, I asked. 
Yesterday, Saturday from Reno. When do you fly out again? Tomorrow, 8 a.m., Vegas. My smartwatch glowed in the candlelight. It's nearly midnight. I'm going to fly out of Burbank in the morning. Burbank is not close to West Hollywood. There was really no freeway between the two, which made the 12-mile trip a long one by car in early morning commute traffic. Jeez Louise, you need to get going. So when are you back, he asked while hopping into his underwear. I'm not sure anyone looks dignified putting their underwear back on. Stripping is a one-way street. He left the room, scouring around the apartment for his clothes and anything else he dropped along the way. He appeared again, fully dressed. August, end of August. So, I'll see you then? Um, sure. I didn't know what to do with that. Did he think, oh, after summer we would resume right where we left off? Wouldn't he be in some kind of serious relationship by then? This perfect woman had been fallen from the sky or off romance authors who text too damn much and ask too many questions but don't answer any? He kissed me once sweetly, then again. It was the way I kissed classic car guy when I didn't want him to leave. Wrong kind of kiss from the wrong kind of person. I let Thunder pull out the door, leaving the outside light on only long enough to see him down my long walkway to the street where his wide share car would soon be. Then I flipped it off and took myself to bed. My habit of texting too much hadn't waned. Thunderbolt was no exception to that. I'd rein it in one day, but today wasn't that day. Me? You made a bad, bad shitty. Did I mention it was bad? Week better. I'm going to find and friend you on Facebook so you can have Rome romance in your feed. Safe travels. Good night. As I write this the next Monday, I'm still feeling just the tiniest bit unsettled. Every moment I was with Classic Car Guy, it was like I was holding on to smoke. I tried my hardest to be in the present moment with him. That living in the present thing is all the rage in LA. To try not to do anything that would make him up and skitter away. It didn't feel quite right, though. How is it I never found out where he lived more than vague generalities? I mean, I think I could pin it down to one of the cities in the San Gabriel Valley, but that's the best I could do. Was it weird that he never scrubbed place info from the pictures he took all around the Southland, but those at his home couldn't be pinpointed by the best CIA agent? In the beginning, I googled Quote, is he having an affair? Which, of course, led to, quote, if you're Googling this, you already know the answer. That wasn't my hunch. My devout Christian friend said it was because he had less money and this maybe made him less than open. I told him I'd grown up poor. I showed him pictures from my family albums about my very humble beginnings. I thought he understood that, one, I didn't judge based on money. Two, I wasn't a snob. I also wonder why he went by his middle name. By the time I pretended to stumble on his first name, I had already Googled that much. Or the fact that he refused to use a license plate. Weird. People have their things, I had rationalized. Or the fact that he mostly called me from his car. One night, we'd had this two-hour conversation while he was in his parked car in front of his house. I'd been in California for a long time. I might even love my car a little too much, with its vanity plates that spell out the word author surrounded by glittering rhinestones. What I don't ever do is sit in it when it's not moving. Well, except on the freeway, but that couldn't be helped. I still felt like there was some piece I wasn't seeing, something that would give me a key to everything I felt like I didn't understand. But that's magical thinking. I could only make a decision based on the information I was given, which was sufficient to know I couldn't live with crumbs. That had to be enough. It was enough or not enough. Either way, I'd made an irreversible decision and had to live by it. In a way, I felt like I was treating Thunderbolt like collateral damage. But Thunderbolt was a grown-ass man who could any time have nothing more to do with me, who at least twice seemed to be heading that way before boomeranging back. I'll insist to anyone who asks that Thunderbolt and I are not in a relationship. But we are. Not boyfriend and girlfriend, that's for sure. But lovers, I guess. Maybe even friends. Okay, so I remember, like, very, very little of that. Like, almost none of that. I'm actually so surprised by all of that that I don't know what to say. Um, I don't know. (laughs) There are no words. Um, There are literally no words for that. I don't remember Thunderbolt behaving that way, although he always behaves the same, so I guess that shouldn't be a shock. I don't remember, like, being, feeling that bad. I remember hiring the forensic accountant because my ex was being squirrely about money. 
um, and he wouldn't give any information about um, the business to the attorneys. I remember, so, you know, you go to court, and I filed a, a, what is it called, discovery motion, sorry, and I was like, I need all the information on the business, um, which I had, but it was getting old because the divorce was going on so long, and, um, you know, he was working at the business, and I was not, so I wanted so I used to you know obviously have front row access to all this information but I no longer did and he's not the only person in the business so you know there's some issues with like partnership and secrecy or whatever I don't even want to get into that and so he wouldn't give it so I had to hire a forensic accountant at great cost to give me information that like I was 90% sure I had but I wasn't clear on what had happened in the meantime and I needed that information to go forward. I can't divide up a business when I don't know what it's worth because I don't know what's happened for a year or a year and a half or whatever it was by that point. Um, but I just, uh, I, so I remember the first like, forensic account, the career suicide part, who knows? Like, I literally don't remember that. I don't remember what I did to implode my career at that point. Probably wasn't a good day. I wonder if like some release had just gone off the rails or I just don't remember um, that either. But so I don't remember the career suicide. Do you remember the forensic accountant? I of course remember Thunderbolt because who could forget him? But I don't remember that specific occasion. Um, and the beer. I remember the beer. If you had told me, I would have thought it was a different day. Um there's so many, I have so many questions. I want to like call Thunderbolt and be like, remember all these things? Could you clarify? Um, and I won't do that <laughs> despite the urge, um, and not having lost his number. So I remember I just, um, he was really like, a a way station, I guess. Like anytime anything bad happened or I felt bad, I called him and he mostly came. <laughs> he always came, actually. Sorry, that was a horrible thing. Uh, he mostly came over and um, just distracted me from like all the bad stuff. <laughs> but do I want a boyfriend? And I said, I don't know. But the answer was yes. That's so funny. Um, I don't. If, if you asked me the question point blank today, I don't know how I would answer it. I mean, the answer, the true answer is. Sure, I'm looking for a long-term relationship and partner. The word boyfriend's weird. But especially like, you know, past, I don't know, 23. But um, I don't know if he or somebody else asked me point blank. I still would probably be mealy-mouthed around the answer. Um, You know, I was reading this book this morning. No, take it back. I didn't, I, I read it later. But I was um, listening to this podcast this morning called The Adult Chair with this woman named Michelle Schalfund. And she was talking to this woman whose name is Christy Whitman, which, by the way, seems like an unfortunate name, because when I Googled her, I had to put in all these extras to not get the former New Jersey governor. Um, so I like Googled her, and she talked a lot about manifesting and what was interesting, uh, and the law of attraction. But what was interesting about it is she was talking about like the need to speak out loud what you want and to really sort of think about what you want, because in your head... You'll say one thing and um, out loud you do the opposite or vice versa. It doesn't matter. But there's an incongruity there. And, you know, one needs to be in alignment. So I guess I'll say this out loud. Yes, I would like a boyfriend. Um, and I don't have one now. I have another situation because I can't seem to get the fuck out of those. But I don't have a boyfriend. And I think I'd want one. So then... If words have power and you can manifest what you want, then it's a matter of speaking the words that you want. So I think I'm going to go watch a video that um, was linked to in the show notes of that episode and uh, <laughs> maybe think more about manifesting and being uh, congruent myself because the biggest thing I complain about about all these men is their incongruency. They say one thing and they do another, you know, and it, it drives me crazy. But... Um, if we end up with people who are similar to us, then maybe if I can live in my own congruency, I will meet people who are the same.
I'm Jolie Moore, and this has been 51st Dates, the podcast. If you enjoyed listening, I hope you'll share, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts. It will help others find the craziness that is dating in Southern California. Also, please hit the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you'd like to read ahead, my memoir, 51st Dates, is available wherever books are sold. A link is always included in the show notes. I'm also a romance writer. If you want to know more about my books, please visit joliemore.com for more information. You can also follow me on Instagram at xojoliemore and on all social media at the same handle, xojoliemore. Thanks for listening, and I'll be in your ears next week.